still underway. We have track still underway. I think we have some athletes that may be um, riding a bike before they come in, but we decided since all of you are on time, we're going to go ahead and start. So, good evening. I'm guessing that it probably hasn't even dawned on many of you that, and especially if you're a senior, you are just a mere six and a bit weeks from graduation. So it has dawned on you. With the end of our year fast approaching, and with our minds already thinking ahead to new travels, new experiences, and the beginning of next chapters of very important lives, I'm delighted to be spending this evening with you and with our final speaker in this year's Serving and Shaping Her World Speaker Series, Erin Michelson. Tonight, she'll be treating us to her story of how she created a journey, a mission, and a new chapter in her very exciting life. Starting on New Year's Day, 2011, Erin embarked on a two-year global giving adventure traveling to all seven continents and more than 60 countries. Throughout her travels, Erin volunteered with local humanitarian organizations from building a house in the Philippines to starting a library in Laos, from caring for orphans in Zambia to working with endangered wildlife. Erin chronicled her adventures on her blog, GoErinGo.com, and was christened the new philanthropist in a National Geographic Traveler article profiling her trip, which is actually how we found out about it. An intrepid traveler, Erin has traveled to more than 90 countries and lived and studied in New Zealand, China, Hong Kong, and South Africa. Now based in San Francisco and in New York, she runs a consulting firm focused on helping nonprofit organizations achieve exponential growth. She's also writing her book, Adventure Philanthropist do out this coming fall and is speaking at schools and corporations and civic organizations across the United States. She told us at dinner that for her, one of the biggest challenges has been re-entry to the United States. So I want you to help her with that and provide a very warm Emma welcome as she re-enters and shares her travel adventure with us. Erin? I'm so excited to be here tonight with all of you and to share a little bit of my story as I travel around uh, the world. So let's get going with it. Um, this is a cute picture of two little girls and the Sesi Islands, which are an island grouping in the middle of Lake Victoria in Uganda. And I actually met them about five years ago um, doing some trekking and doing some volunteer work on the islands. And I just thought they were adorable and cute and a nice way to greet you guys here in the audience. But let's talk for a second about what is an adventure philanthropist. When I think about philanthropy, I think about it in the broadest possible terms. I think about it as volunteering. I think about it as giving money and donating. I think about it as really just becoming involved and informed about critical issues that are, that are shaping our society today. So to me, anybody could be a philanthropist. You don't have to be rich. We can all participate and get involved and give back. And the adventure part of it, that's just fun. For me, I define adventure as a lot of adventure sports and travel because that's what my passion is. And so I decided when I was gonna go on this two year trip, I would combine these two great things. So I really think about it as a little bit destination plus inspiration, or really about combining my passion with a purpose. So here's a map of where I went. My Aaron Goes Global track. So the black dots are the countries I had been to before. The red dots are the countries I actually went to during the two years. And I spent exactly two years on the road. So um, I had a goal, and I knew it was going to be extreme, and I purposely wanted it to be extreme for that reason. I wanted to push myself, my boundaries, both physically and mentally, and really see what it would be like to live as a nomad and travel around the world. Now you can see, too, so I went really from the Arctic Circle all the way to Antarctica down here from you know, kayaking in the fjords of New Zealand to kayaking again up in the fjords of Norway, Borneo, London, everywhere in between. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I literally went like this with my itinerary. There was really no set plan. All I know is I wanted to be on the road for two years, and I wanted it to be open enough so that whenever I met somebody who had a really great idea, 
or was from a country that I hadn't been to before, that I actually go and experience it myself. And so except for a few things like maybe hiking the Himalayas or to go see Angkor Wat, everything was very spur of the moment um, so I could really, really live in the moment as I travel. Now, while this trip was a little chaotic in terms of itinerary, I was actually very, very focused on what I wanted personally to get out of the trip. So as I mentioned, I wanted to push boundaries. And to me, that was both physical and mental. I wanted to do things like hike the Himalayas. I wanted to hike in the jungles of Colombia. I wanted to do all the kayaking and the scuba diving, because that's just what I like to do. But it was also really, it's actually a picture of Annapurna. Annapurna Base Camp, so that was a 12-day trek in. You could see the little people up there. We actually had to traverse several avalanches to get up there and stay in uh, tea houses along the way. And it's about a good three to four days past any mules. So you know you're pretty far up country when there's no cars and there's no mules even to get there. And I'm from Hawaii, and so this was a big stretch for me to be in the cold like this. I also really wanted to um, so I'm going to go back in and talk a little bit about the mental um, part of it as well. I wanted to, like I said, make it extreme and to really um, be alone in my trip. So it was a solo journey, and I like to be alone, otherwise you would never even think about going away by yourself for two years. But I really wanted to kind of experience the fear and the loneliness and really kind of see how I was going to do it, deal with them along the way. And. Um, a couple times we were talking about at dinner about whether or not I wanted to come home. And there were a couple bad spots, let me tell you, where I did feel really lonely, I did feel really scared. But I was really, really focused on actually living in the moment and experiencing and dealing with it. And I was curious, just almost as an outsider, how I would deal with it. And so along the trip, there was maybe 10, 12 times where I really thought, like, can I continue to do this? Um, as there were a couple of times physically, less physical actually than mental, um, in terms of toughness. So it was really, uh, it was a big challenge for me, which is what I like. The second thing I really wanted for my trip in terms of the outcomes was I wanted continual learning. So I really wanted to um, get to know new cultures and communities, and for me, that's through volunteering. That's the best way to really get on the ground and to experience um, these new places and people that I didn't, I didn't even know existed, quite frankly. This is a picture from the Koji Indians, and it's taken in Colombia. I did the five-day trek to Colombia's lost city, Ciudad Padilla, and these are some Indians' um, children on the way, and you can tell this is a little boy because he has a bag, and she has some beads, so it's a little girl, and that's the only way you can actually really tell them apart, since they all wear kind of the dress. And as we were hiking through uh, the coca fields, actually, to get to the beautiful lost city, which I think are some of the most beautiful ruins in the world, um, we stopped and we played with them in the village, and we played with them in waterfalls, and we kept you know, throwing things in the water and jumping in. And it was really, really um, a fantastic part, and probably one of the reasons why I really liked the journey um, to the lost city so much, was getting to know this community. And it's not only just about getting to know the cultures, it was also reading. So every time you know, I went to a new region, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, I would read the authors, the really famous authors from that region. And then I also did a lot of writing. So as we mentioned, I had my blog, so I was writing three times a week, pretty religiously on the road. And, um, and I have now about 500 posts, actually, of written work. So to me, it was like actually physically being there to learn about the cultures, it was reading the culture, reading about the cultures, and then writing about it where I did research. But oddly enough, I sort of did the research after I was already there, because I didn't have the set itinerary, so I didn't do the research beforehand, which to me was all part of the fun. Because when I met new people and new cultures, everything was completely new to me, and I had zero expectations or zero preconceptions. And to me, that was a really big part of the trip. And the third part, or the third objective, that I wanted personally to get out of the trip, besides pushing my own boundaries, and besides continual living, was giving back. And these, are, these little sweet peas are from uh, a children's home that I volunteered with in Kathmandu, Nepal. And they're actually local children. Besides the children's home, they do outreach to uh, small children in the community to come and do reading and writing. And uh, these little children were there um, part of the days I was there. I was there for a week doing one-on-one -on -one consulting with them and um, helping them try to find funding here in the United States. So kind of rolling up my sleeves. We also did a lot of, of course, just games and playing with them and everything else. So to me, giving back was really the core of my journey. 
Uh, and I did this in a number of ways. When I went on the trip, I decided I would just sell everything I had, which wasn't that much. I mean, it was a car and some furniture. I gave away all my clothes, which is fairly traumatic. Uh, traveled with one suitcase. And um, I was just going to live this life of a nomad. What I did with that money is I started a charitable fund. So my goal was to start this fund. I had about $25,000 that I would then give away as I continued to travel throughout the world. So I was either volunteering or I was giving small donations. And the really fun part of it, I thought, was that um, people who were reading my site got to dictate where I gave the donations. So I'm very into this idea of what I call participatory philanthropy. So that people, as I would say, I am, you know, I'm in Nepal. This is one of the charities that I help give a donation to. When I'm in Nepal, you know, I'll sponsor the children for $500. If I get, you know, 500 yes votes, I'll double it. If I get 1,500, I'll triple it. To try to tell people that philanthropy is so much fun to get involved, and there's such a low barrier that they don't even have to give their own money away. They could just give my money away, um, as Ma says, is to these uh, incredible organizations. And so it was a great, fun way, even though I was traveling on the road, to stay connected with different readers and family and friends back home and to give to them. So that was the core of my trip. And even, I want to say too, so even if you're not volunteering or giving donations, um, when I went to visit places like Burma, um, a lot of other countries actually, I would simply go to a local store and buy uh, school supplies and then bring them to a local school and that way I get to interact even at the most basic level. We did that in the San Blas Islands, for instance, the islands between Colombia and Panama. And I sailed through there, and I went and brought on the boat with me loads of books and coloring books and pens for the students. And I always found that's a really great way, even if you don't have a formalized you know, volunteer job or stint going on, you could still get to meet the community in a way that's really great in getting back. So to me, those were really the three things that I was after. And here's my trip. So, where I went everywhere, the one story I think that's going to most tell you kind of the tenor, give you the tenor of my trip is, is really through one story, uh, and I think it's in Uganda is going to be the best one. So obviously here's uh, the map of Africa, and here's the map of Uganda. Uh, there's Kampala, the capital, and my trip really took place north of this. It's really not on the map by Gulu, actually just above where the U is in Uganda is where I did a lot of my volunteering in this particular story. And these are the mountain gorillas, right? So you're not going to go to Uganda without seeing the mountain gorillas. Actually, I did. This is my second trip to Uganda. And my first trip, I didn't get to see the mountain gorillas. And I was a little devastated. <laughs> so I made sure on my second trip back, I was going to do this. For me, this was the pushing the boundaries part of this story. Um, I wanted to go and see them. They're actually um, by Lake Lugundi. That was actually in the south. Um, west of the country, of course, bordering uh, Rwanda and Congo. And there's a national park there. And you know, of course, there's only 800 mountain gorillas left, which is mind-boggling and sad because they're magnificent creatures. And the way it works is you buy a permit um, for $500, and you go there, and you hope to see them. But there's no guarantee. And so the day we went, they let in. 64 volunteers every day, and you get an hour with the gorillas if you find them. And you go escorted with men with machetes. That will clear the path for you and seriously through the jungle. And that's some pretty serious jungle there. And you go with men with machine guns as well to uh, protect you um, from some of the violence that is going on in the area and from the poachers, which are the ones, of course, who are taking these animals. Actually, just incidentally, I just read recently that the gorillas now um, have figured out how to dissemble the poaching. Um, traps. And so that's how smart that, that they are, that they've actually, they've seen the traps now and they can disable them themselves. So it's a um, tremendous thing. I, I certainly hope, obviously, that their numbers come by. So we tracked on my particular track for about five hours into the jungle that day. And I was getting kind of nervous because I thought, oh my gosh, we may not see them. And how can I come to Uganda twice and not see the mountain gorillas? And luckily, um, really in the final sort of half an hour, we found them of trekking uphill, <laughs> mainly uphill, downhill, a lot of uphill. And we got to spend time with them. And really, they're so close, it's from here to the pillar, is how close we are to them. So if you get the chance to go, absolutely go. Um, it's really spectacular and certainly worth it. Also in the trip, in terms of pushing my boundaries, was sort of the mental aspect of going to Uganda for me. 
As I mentioned, this is my second trip to Uganda, so I've been there before. It was my third trip to Africa. I had studied at the University of Cape Town, um, and so I've spent many, many months in Africa. Um, and yet going to Lyra um, was sort of a step beyond, right? So Lyra is the home of the Lord's Revolutionary Army, which is Kony 2012, um, the area of mass rape, child soldiers. And while that was sort of more or less over by the time I got there, it had only really only been over for maybe a year, maybe 18 months. And so it was still a hotbed of activity in that area and pretty worrisome to travel there alone. My plan actually wasn't to travel there alone. I had two, two volunteering gigs that I set up before I went and uh, this was one of them. And unfortunately, my best laid plans fell through. I was supposed to go sort of with the founder of the nonprofit organization that I went with based in LA and travel with them. And he was going to escort me from Kampala up to Lira, which is five hours on a paved road. And then further on this road, this is the actual road, three hours to the actual well that I was going there to build. So three hours there and three hours back uh, on a good day when it's not raining on this road. And unfortunately, as I said, those best laid plans kind of fell through. So there I was hiking with the gorillas to see them, and the whole time I'm thinking, do I actually go by myself then up to Lyra to build this well? And uh, I really had to think about it. I had had a number of sort of close calls on the road, and, um, and it was really not a very safe area, and I had to figure it out. And after a lot of soul searching, I decided I was going to go, but I did so after taking the necessary precautions. So for instance, um, before I left the United States, when I knew I was going to travel in the first year to both the Middle East and Africa, uh, I took out kidnap and ransom insurance, personally. I also had personal safety uh, measures that I took with my family, where I had safe words, that if they got any sort of written or verbal message from me, you know, using this word, they knew immediately to start the rescue operation, <laughs> as it was going to be. Um, I took a self-defense class for three days that um, really helped me become much more aware of my surroundings. And so these are the things I really draw upon, and I thought, okay, with this training and with these safety precautions, um, I would actually go in the area. I then, of course, hired a private bodyguard, <laughs> not of course, but I then went ahead and had to hire a driver who then served as a, as a bodyguard as well, um, who was excellent. And I was able to do that because I had volunteered previously, five years ago, in Uganda, as I mentioned, and I had friends there, and they set it up for me. It was a driver that was trained in Germany, took his job very seriously, and I felt safe enough to go, and I was able to make my own um, arrangements. And so after overcoming those, as I said, the mental boundaries are always much harder than the physical boundaries, I decided to go to Lyra. And these are actually, these are some of um, the guys, the good guys who took us in to uh, see the gorillas. So you can kind of see, I think, um, his machine gun up there, but they actually, that was the jungle that they kind of hacked a path through for us. So uh, pretty thick. And the reason why I decided to go uh, to Lyra was because I had um, this quench for continual learning, but I really wanted to understand much more deeply about the issue of water. To me, I knew it was important, but I wanted to see for myself. So as I said, I wanted to go, and uh, I had planned to donate a well. I had donated the, water, the money for a well, and incidentally, before, it was the readers on my blog who chose where the well was going to be. They had three choices before my trip. So it was either going to be Uganda, Kenya, or Southern Sudan. Uh, for my family's sake, they were very happy. It wasn't Southern Sudan, it was Uganda. And so that's where we chose the well to be in Lira. Um, part of it, too, as I said, I was very, very dedicated to this issue of water. And if you see this little boy here, he's carrying, he's, he's actually just off the side of that road, in the picture I showed you a moment ago. And he has these two yellow buckets there. And uh, if you've been to Africa, you see these in other areas of the world a lot. That's where you carry the water. They each hold 20 liters of water. And a typical African family, which usually has about 10 people in it, multi-generations, uses 100 liters a day. So five of those buckets. So he needs to go back to the well at least twice on his bicycle. And quite frankly, he's pretty lucky he even has a bicycle because most of the time it's the women who are wearing uh, or carrying the water on their heads. And that liter bucket, that 20 liter bucket is about 44 pounds. So if you could picture, that's actually the, the maximum luggage that you could put in an airline is 44 pounds. That's how heavy it is that they're carrying on their heads. 
and the young girls as well are carrying that, which trend, you know, tremendous problems in terms of compressing their spine and uh, their hips and for childbearing later and all these things. So for these reasons, uh, I did decide to make the trip to Lyra because I really wanted to see for myself um, the impact of water. So let's just take a second. Um, this is the only slide where I have actual words on it. But I, I think it's so important to really look at the statistics of it. That 50% of Africans lack access to clean water. That 80% of disease in developing countries is due to poor drinking water and sanitation. And this last one is frightful. Every day, 10,000 children under the age of five die from water-related illnesses. To me, this is why the issue of water is so incredibly important and the largest one, I think, really in the developing world and in all the globe for me. And here's the well. So here are the two pictures of the well, sort of before and the after picture. So this is the well just north of that town in Ligera, uh, Lira when I first went because I was there for the groundbreaking, the actual digging of the well. And there's a woman with her yellow water bucket. So she only has one and she's walking. So that means she has to go back and forth five times a day to get the water for their family. So they used the five, the five uh, buckets, the 100 liters. 40 of the liters go for drinking water for a family of 10. So two buckets go for drinking. Three buckets then are used for water in the garden, cooking, cleaning, bathing for the entire family. Some estimates in developing countries is that a woman spends up to 85% of her day just getting water. That's how much it takes back and forth this heavy load. And unfortunately, especially for the people in Lira before they had the new well, this well was contaminated. So now, because it was only six meters deep, not only did she have to take the water, haul it back, she had to boil it before it could be used for anything. So again, that would be an example of water and water consumption taking an entire day for that woman. Here's the new well that was sent to me after I went. Um, here are the kids, they're like super cute. And uh, the new well is built and it's actually 20 meters deep. So hopefully there will be no problems with contamination. The well will actually feed um, or give water to four villages, which is about 5,000 people. Um, the well cost a donation of $5,500. And um, so it's about a dollar for clean water for entire uh, for the entire four villages or 5,000 people, um, which I think is money extremely well spent, and I was happy to do it. So giving back. So as I said, I went to build the well and to learn more intimately about the issue of water and how it was affecting the children and the community and the women in that community. Um, and I got to do it in a way that really helped, um, really helped sustain me in terms of giving back. He, these are the school kids. So that second well was actually built on the grounds of the school. And they did that on purpose so that the community members would continue to come to school and that the school principal then could oversee sort of the operation and the security of the well. So these are students from that school. I like this guy because he has a picture of a motorcycle that he's showing that he wants everybody to see. And, um, and there's about 350 students. Um, there, so about the same size of your school. Um, half of them are boarding and half of them make that trek uh, on the dirt road. Um, too many of them live far out and so they can't actually uh, go every day. And um, yeah, these are the high school students and junior high school students of Apache HDA where the well is actually being built. And again, by, by really being in the community there and hanging out with the children, here I am, uh, um, with the children, uh, these little girls, so, so cute, and, and going and watching the well being built. And here's the well and the drillers there. Um, while the machinery was Western, all the labor of the drillers and the people building the well were African, so that's great in terms of giving back to the community and for the ongoing maintenance of the well. And this is what I really, really was going for in this experience, was to get to know the community on this kind of level, where I could really meet the children, see them, um, I talked to the community members, mostly in church, just because that's where everybody was gathering. And the church was just an open air, just this batch group, about this size, um, with some batching on it. And we sat in there a couple days, and there was a lot of singing and dancing and plays going on um, to kind of talk about what's going on in their community. And uh, it was a fantastic experience. So you see the plaque that I'm holding. The plaque, it's actually the name of the organization there. And then the plaque reads, 
May your life overflow with possibilities. And to me, um, as the donor of the well, I got to choose the inscription, and so I wrote this inscription. And it means a lot to me for a couple reasons. First, it meant mainly, in, and I wrote it for the children of Lura, Uganda, because I wanted them to have possibilities, and I wanted the well to give them water and to improve their lives in terms of health, in terms of their being able to stay in school, in terms of you know not being able to use all of their time searching and boiling for the water. It also had a great deal of, um, it really resonated with me personally, because when I decided to go on this journey and sort of give everything up and go on two years, which was extreme, um, once I thought of the idea, I couldn't not go on the journey. To me, it was such a possibility, and so few people have the opportunity in life and lack of responsibilities that they can actually go and take a journey like this. And so it was a good reminder for myself that whenever I had the possibility to grab a hold of it, and thirdly, I think this is a really good um, sort of inscription for all of you as well, to make your life overflow with possibilities and to really think about, as you're going out there into the world, what are the possibilities and what can you do with it? What can you create? And as we go and we talk about it and bring it back to venture philanthropy specifically, what can we do in terms of what's your passion and what can you do with a purpose to really bring it back? What are the possibilities there? As you travel overseas, how can you volunteer? As you volunteer, how can you give back, whether it's just school supplies or a modest donation? If you don't even make a donation, it's fine if you just become really involved and aware of the issue and how can you start a campaign here, whether it's on the internet or getting people together. How can you really incorporate this into your life? And so this is why I really sort of challenge and wish for you all as well is to go out there and find your passion and to match it with the possibilities. And with this, I really hope may your life overflow. basically every two weeks, so I was moving really fast. Obviously, speaking English is a great advantage, and I really found that if I could go and just learn 10 basic words and smile a whole bunch and be really nice, you could get by amazingly. I used to talk with people for hours and really have no idea how, other than just you know drawing pictures and, and um, gesticulating and all those things to get the point across. So um, it's certainly better if you could speak a language, but I would not have any language. I would not not go to that country. Do I have a favorite place? It depends on the day. Now today, if you ask me, um, the, what I really consider a place that's really great for me is something that's really unique and different. As I mentioned before, I think um, at dinner we're talking about Ethiopia is a great place for me. There's a country that has its own language, its own food, its own dress, its own religion. It's really fascinating. Vietnam's another one. I love Morocco and maybe Mozambique. So no, not one favorite. Yes? Great. So the question is, is um, why I focused overseas and internationally instead of here domestically. Um, actually, no, I work. So my consulting business that I went on sabbatical from for two years was as a professional fundraiser uh, in, here in the United States. And when I set up my business, I did it so I can uh, work nine months out of the year here and, and work three months out of the year overseas. And I did it knowing that the three months would be pro bono for me. So I literally one day sat back and thought what would be the perfect job for me personally to do what I love to do in terms of working with nonprofits and to travel. And I created this consulting business and um, had my most successful year ever. So of course it made sense to shut it down and then go away for two years. And then since I've been back now about three months or so, um, I have already started consulting again. But um, my degrees, I have three degrees, they're all in political science. 
Um, they're not in business on the, on the nonprofit side um, because, again, I'm much more interested in social issues um, and global issues. So that's what draws me to this work. And I had a career in corporate finance, actually, for many years, and then went the nonprofit route, working with major nonprofits here um, to learn from the ground up, and went back to corporate, nonprofit, corporate, nonprofit. So my career was definitely like this until I got to the point where I built up this expertise in uh, sort of a very Wall Street approach to fundraising for nonprofits. Yes? How do you raise the money for your trip? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> the, how did I raise the money for my trip? The, the, it was my savings. It was all self-finance. So basically, I was living in Northern California and um, saving to buy a house and decided uh, I would take that money instead and go on this two-year trip. So all in all, it's about eighty dollars to $100,000 that I spent on the trip. I wasn't a backpacker. I'm what they call a flashpacker. I don't know if you're in the travel industry. There's a, there's a differentiate there. So uh, a flashpacker is somebody who has a wheelie, not a backpack. It means I usually had a pedicure, and if things got really tough, I could actually go to Marriott if I had to, um, which only happened once or twice. But um, it's self-financed. I also did that on purpose, too, with the charity part of it. I didn't take donations because um, I wanted to control the giving, um, but people had input into where I gave that way. Yes? Where did you stay overnight as you were traveling these places without any mm -hmm. Yeah, it was hard overnight. Um, that was probably the biggest question always on my mind is where I'm going to sleep tomorrow night, uh, literally. Um, that's all I thought about for two years. Uh, it was, for the most part, there were small sort of like pensions throughout most of it. Uh, in the last four or five months, I was in Latin America and I stayed at hostels, just because at that point I was running out of money. And so I was, you know, and you do question yourself, how can I be as old as I am and sleep in a room with, you know, 16 smelly guys, I don't know. But, you know, it worked out okay. But for the most part, they were small little, ho uh, small little hotels, certainly no big chains or anything. Yeah. Yeah, back there, sorry. Uh, was the scariest situation? How did I deal with it? Um, I probably had about 10 to 12 pretty startling experiences. Um, which one was the scariest? I would say I was crossing the Zambia Malawi border by foot. I traveled most of the time, as I said, on um, taking local transportation. Usually I was the only foreigner around and uh, was walking across the border and I got in a car and then about four other guys got in the car with me and had to jump out of the moving car and do all kinds of things. So that was pretty scary. Yeah. Yes? Um, did you ever have a camera instead of like staying somewhere with people just like so remote that you just like camp? Yeah, I camp a lot. The question is whether or not I can. I love camping. So to me, like I'm an outdoors person, so I went on multi-day kayaking trips in Fjordland at the very end. Um, I got to camp actually in Antarctica, which was amazing. I took the, the first boat out this season, that was the real finale of my trip, and we're the first boat out this season, and the first ones to actually step on the continent uh, for the season, and we got to, to camp on the continent, which is really rare, and that was incredible. Stayed in loads of jungle camps, and hammocks, and everything else, certainly. Camping to me wasn't a bad thing, it was always a good thing. Yes? What countries are you planning to go in the future? The countries I'm planning to go to in the future, um, there were about 10 countries that I missed out on on this trip that I really wanted to go to for either political reasons, they were canceled. Actually, I canceled a couple of countries like Venezuela and Madagascar and Papua New Guinea. They were um, all um, sometimes pretty violent things going on there, so I canceled it. Or just simply logistics. Um, or they were too expensive, like the Seychelles, which I'm a big scuba diver, so I just really want to go there. Um, but there's about 10 that are on my new bucket list that changes constantly. Yes? <laughs> go ahead, yes. The most inspiring thing I saw? Um, I would have to say, to me, again, it was in Ethiopia, which I think is why I'm so drawn to Ethiopia. I did some really great um, volunteering work there that I found really, um, really impactful for myself. So I gave, I was sort of the guest of the Ethiopian government and did a workshop, a fundraising workshop for about 40 organizations 
working on the area of HIV AIDS in Ethiopia, which is one of the top countries in Africa actually dealing with it, even though you don't really hear about it in terms of AIDS and HIV AIDS that often. And, uh, and I then chose two organizations to do one-on-one -on -one work, real, uh, real detailed work. And one was this organization um, that was working to help lessen the stigma of women with AIDS in Ethiopia, which was very high. And so they had uh, a beauty pageant, actually, uh, for Miss HIV um, AIDS Ethiopia. And I'm generally not a huge fan of beauty pageants, but I thought that this, this was a really fantastic way. Um, they gave them a small gift of money to be in the pageant. Um, and then they really, really celebrated the winter, winter so that you could still be beautiful and still be a woman um, and still be HIV positive. I thought that was really interesting. And I did another um, volunteer experience with a group with one of the only, what would uh, for us be a federal level judge working in Ethiopia on women's rights. I do a lot of work with children and women's rights and I'm still in contact with her today and she does amazing work in a very difficult country there. Was uh, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. what, uh, how do you feel that you changed as a person due to this Yeah, that's a good question. How have I, how have I changed as a person? Um, I'm still changing, so I haven't really figured it out. Because as we talked about in terms of re-entry, that I'm now just sort of getting past the immediacy of the trip. For a while there, I was just thinking again about you know. Where am I going to stay tomorrow night? Should I be in that taco? And the guy behind me, you know, should he be there? And so now that I've taken the step back, can I really start to unpack a little of what I've seen? I mean, I had the tremendous advantage. I didn't really, because I didn't have a set itinerary, I didn't really plan it this way. But I have um, a capsule or a snapshot of global poverty in two years from all these countries I went to. And I think that's a really rare thing. And I think. I'm going to be, you know, sort of chewing on that, digesting that for years to come. Um, so I think who I am today, three months after a trip versus six months versus a year and then three years, I'm going to change. I knew starting out on the trip that I would be a different person, but I wasn't sure how. And I'm still exactly not sure how I've changed. Wait and see. Um, in my experience somewhere? Botswana. Botswana. I love Botswana, actually. Um, the, I was there uh, in the Okavango del Delta, which I thought was one of the most spectacular safari I've ever been on because you, know, you go in the Mapora, which is the dugout canoe, uh, and you go into the reeds, and it's really cool. And you camp, which again is really cool for me. I thought it was stupendous. And one of the other things about the Okavango is that um, not only did you get to see it from the water, like really in it, I then took a helicopter ride over it to see the enormity of it. And that was really, really impressive. And so um, I, I love that in terms of just, you know, in terms of safari. We also met some women there um, who were making bracelets and beads, and we bought a lot of things uh, from bracelets with them. So we did have a little bit of impact with the community. Uh, and we got to learn a lot there because the safari I went on um, was actually on a private game reserve. And as we flew over with the uh, helicopter, we saw these incredible bull elephants that were so majestic with the tusks. And the pilot was saying, oh, they're probably not going to be here next week because of the game hunters, mainly from America, were coming in. And it's, he gave us the price list, 50000 for an elephant, you know, so much for a giraffe, like 10000 for a giraffe, this much for a rhino. And to be able to, you know, fly over the delta and see the beauty of it, and to know that's not going to be there because somebody is going to pay to, to basically poach it, um, was heartbreaking. So, um, yeah, that's one. It was great. And I'm sorry, I went off. What was your first question again? Uh, when you're going back to your my travels. Um, when am I going back to the travels? I think uh, my intention was always to finish up traveling in the United States because I think it's a little bit hypocritical to go overseas and look at pockets of poverty overseas and not look at the pockets of poverty here in the United States. We have tremendous poverty in our Native American communities, in communities in New Orleans and, and everywhere actually, in Detroit, in New York, you know. Um, San Francisco, the Bay Area, everywhere. And so probably this fall, I'm going to start driving around North America, Canada, and Mexico, and start doing the pro bono work that I used to do overseas um, here. So I do think that's really important. Yes? about 
uh, to avoid dangerous situations. And to like not let it impact what you're doing. Well, I think it's hard not to let it impact because it's a big part of it. I mean, you're going to these areas in the world, and while it's dangerous for us, that's like everyday living for the people who live there. Um, and so there's no separating the two. And I think if you're going to go into international nonprofit work, international philanthropy, that is something that you think about. And do you have, not the stomach, but can you actually deal with it? Um, again, before I went, so what I consider a pretty dangerous area, um, I did take the precautions beforehand. I had the insurance. I had the safety precautions with my family and procedures. I learned what I could in terms of self-defense to you know, be aware of situations. So I think it's really about making sure um, you feel as safe as you can, as you can, and then you have to make a decision. I mean, I did bail out of several countries actually, where I just went and said, "Give me the next flight out," um, where it was too dangerous to get there after I've always been there. So you just need to be able to judge um, the opportunity appropriately and know that that's actually part of international philanthropy. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Has Mexico ever been on your bucket list? Um, yes, I've been to Mexico before. And so I did go this time because I was trying to go to places I haven't been before. But I haven't really explored it. So that's actually, I consider Mexico part of the North American trip. Um, so maybe a little bit of Lower Canada. I don't want to get too cold again. Lower Canada, the US, and then through Mexico, and perhaps part of the Caribbean. So do you have a suggestion of where I should go in Mexico? No. <laughs> First time, uh, pretty badly in Laos. Um, I, I know exactly what happened. I went to a night market. I had some pineapple juice, and it wasn't juice. They cut it with some water, and I was out cold for ten days. Um, so sick that at that point, I felt like it might be more than food poisoning. It might be malaria um, because traveling so long, you can't take any malaria medication or anything. And so, I went back where um, I actually went to Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, to get some blood work done. So. You know you're pretty sick when you're going to Phnom <laughs> for medical attention. Took about a 15-hour bus ride, and luckily there, um, I was able to get some medical attention. If I hadn't been able to, I would have gone to Bangkok for it. So I, I, I need, um, usually in developing countries, I don't go to a hospital because of so much TB and other diseases there that I'm worried about being even more sick. Um, and so a lot of times, if you're really that sick, you simply leave. And then I became, you know, a defensive eater, as we were talking about before. At the end of the trip, I was really bananas and crackers and a couple of things that were, you know, which is sad because, you know, a big part of travel is the food, but being sick by yourself on the road is no fun. Yes? How did you handle the water situation? In so many countries, water is clean. How did you drink water? Mm -hmm. Um, bottled water, which is, you know, not the greatest solution because then you have the plastic bottle. Uh, I used to carry a, a bottle of water with me, you know, a container, but I found it was really difficult to keep clean, actually, um, with the water and stuff, too. So that wasn't a great solution. In Nepal, I used iodine, which I would highly recommend. Um, I didn't have a problem with the taste of the iodine pills, and we certainly would just, you know, um, clean our water every night before we went to bed and then had it. Um, I, would get a, I would get a pen now, you know, they have the water pens, that was the Steri pen, which um, I haven't used, but I saw some people on the road with it. I'd probably get a Steri pen before I left that would simply just dunk it in the water for two minutes and it sterilizes it. So I think that was probably the best solution going forward. Yes? Uh, what did you do when you went to Antarctica? What did I do when I went to Antarctica? Uh, Antarctica was really fun. It's, it's, it's the funny thing about Antarctica. I thought it would be a once-in-a-lifetime trip. I thought, I'm going to pay the money, I'm going to go. And as it turns out, I'm going to go again. It was that amazing. So it's not once-in-a-lifetime. It's going to be twice or three times in a lifetime for me. You really, it's funny when you're down there, the vastness of it, you can't really conceive of the vastness of Antarctica and the beauty of the ice and the snow. You really can't get enough of the penguins that are really, you know, they are really fun and cute. 
um, and the seals, we saw orcas, we saw humpback whales, we saw everything. And what I really loved about it was not only the expedition, so we would go out twice every day on the expedition, but, um, and go camping and kayaking if you get a chance, but it was the lectures too. So when you're back on ship, you know, you can't actually go on land for any extended period of time unless you're at a research um, station. You must just go by boat and you live on the expedition boat. We're, we had incredible uh, professors with us talking about the geology of the land, um, talking about animals, and talking about the international treaties and why nobody owns Antarctica. Really fascinating stuff to me. So I love the whole experience and I would definitely go back again. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I didn't see the whole upper tier. Uh, did you ever receive any negative backlash from the people in the communities that you were trying to help them and so on? Yeah, that's a great question. Did I ever uh, receive any negative backlash? Uh, not from the communities that I visited, um, but uh, that I heard of, right? You know, um, the way I chose the nonprofits that I was working with was really kind of through word of mouth. It was kind of a loose network of people that referred me, that heard what I was doing, and I came in uh, to help them. I certainly tried to make no assumptions and to teach them how to actually fundraise in the US, which was actually a skill they were looking for specifically. So not trying to tell them how to do something better than they were doing it, but how to access some money, which they wouldn't have had access to necessarily. Um, there was, there is a lot of backlash in the blogosphere about volunteering with children's organizations and volunteering with animal organizations. I did both. I did work with whale shark conservation, lion conservation, all kinds of things, um, sea turtle release. I actually felt like I wasn't endangering the animals, but I was helping build awareness about it. The same thing with the children. I certainly understand why you would want to be careful bringing tourists in with children, um, especially in areas like South Asia where sex trafficking is so rampant. You want to be very, very concerned about the children. But, um, but I still felt the work I was doing was meaningful and that a lot of times I wasn't doing direct action work with the children. I was working with the administrators, so I was, there was a little bit of a barrier there. But I think that's where a lot of the backlash comes from, particularly the children and animals. Oh, yes. Um, Some did, but very. Yeah, the question is, is whether or not um, they're really sort of affiliates of a U.S. nonprofit or at least have reach in the U.S. nonprofit. Not really. Very few of them did. They're very small, locally based humanitarian organizations. Um, there is one organization that uh, was based in Nepal that I did work with that actually has a footprint in, in the UK um, and the, the founders based here and I continue to actually work with them now, right now, but for the most part, no, it's really just, um, they're very small organizations and that was part of the reason they wanted me to help is to give them access to the market here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for your attendance at the long day of class.